This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. In my neighborhood growing up over in South Cab County, in our neighborhood, you know, middle class, you, you either became a public servant or you became a bad guy. And uh, more public servants came out of that neighborhood than bad guys, fortunately. When I was in the Marines, it was, it was a quiet time in the world. Nothing much was happening. And it just wasn't that exciting, to tell the truth. Police work was a chance to, to take care of that service gene, that, I, that dreaded service gene I have, where I was able to um, do something and make a difference. And for a while there, it was working. I loved it. Makes my wife crazy, she, because she knows that things would, uh, I would still do it today if possible, and I know it's never gonna happen, but then, but, <laughs> I would still do it. That's how much I believe in, in the job. Being able to stand vanguard between the bad guys and, and the, the innocents, being the uh, sheepdog, you know, the, uh, it was so rewarding just to be able to uh, stand up and be that vanguard. Uh, you know, it's, it's maybe it's uh, hero syndrome, I don't know, but I just enjoyed doing it, and it was a good thing to be done, and needed to be done, and that's why, I, like I said, I love my beat, I love my people, and I miss them. I still do to this day. I'm Sean Kipe. From Imperative Entertainment, this is In the Land of Lies. As Michael Chappell's trial drudged on, his life literally hung in the balance. Weeks of testimony, presentations, and arguments in the death penalty case left the community on edge. Was the former police officer an innocent man who'd been wrongfully accused and possibly framed for murder, or a cold-blooded killer showing no remorse and trying desperately to pin it on anyone but himself? It seemed either outcome was unthinkable. But Chapel never wavered. Mike, did you see Anna Jean Thompson on the night of April 15, 1993? No, I did not. Did you rob Anna Jean Thompson of the money that had been left in her trailer following burglary? No, I did not. Did you kill Anna Jean Thompson? No, I did not. Emma Jean Thompson's blood had become the main point of contention, and Chapel's defense team fought hard to overcome the evidence presented against him. One issue, as Henry explains, was with the DNA testing performed to identify Thompson's blood on the armrest of Chapel's patrol car on the second forensic search performed the day before pretrial hearings began. The first forensic search produced no results. They find this, the armrest in the down position and they lumen all the armrest and like magic, poof. There's 40 nanograms of Imogene Thompson's blood. When I say it's Imogene Thompson's blood, the DNA expert said that the testing method used to determine that it was Imogene Thompson's blood was inconclusive at best. And in fact, that method is no longer used and has not been used virtually since the time of Mike's trial. The type of DNA testing Henry is referring to is called Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism, or RFLP for short. It's an older and slower type of DNA testing rarely used today, as other, more accurate methods are available. And they talked about this at the trial. In order to get a match, you have to determine the center of the known material versus the, you know, testing material. In other words, You've got a sample of Imogene Thompson's blood that they took out of Imogene Thompson that's in a vial. So they, okay, so we use this blood. We know this is Imogene Thompson's blood. And then the material that's on the armrest is the tested material. 
And they say you basically have to align the centers. And once you align the centers, then you determine whether or not the points match the five prong test. Well, when the centers didn't align the first time, they manually realigned the centers and then got a match. Chapel's defense team brought in DNA expert Dr. Jung Choi, who was called to the stand to testify regarding the test results. Choi would later state that, quote, there is no scientific justification for basing a match on partial restriction digest. He goes on to say that the results should have been deemed inconclusive, neither including or excluding the suspect. If there is any material left, it should be retested using current STR technology. A restriction digest is a procedure used in molecular biology to prepare DNA for analysis or other processing. It is sometimes termed DNA fragmentation and is often considered a last resort. Dr. Choi's opinion was essentially, there isn't enough evidence to prove that the blood was that of Emma Jean Thompson's beyond reasonable doubt. That's what was testified to. But they got the result they wanted and they determined that it was Emma Jean Thompson's blood. But their witness said, oh yeah, 100%, the DNA matches. Our witness said, no, another test needed to be run. But of course, conveniently, there was no more blood. They had three vials. If you've got one witness, expert witness, that's saying 100% yes, it's a match, and you've got another expert witness saying no, 100% inconclusive, you discard that evidence all the way around, period. I mean, this is important. This is not, you know, I robbed the grocery store. And they also said on the stand, could you have manipulated these bands on the computer? They line the bands up, from what I understand with DNA, to see if there's a match. Oh yes, you can manipulate the bands on the computer manually. Really? That should have been thrown out then. If two experts testifying to something this crucial to the case don't agree on the results, would it make sense to have a third unbiased expert form an opinion, as Aaron Chappell argues? Now here's what I'll say about it. I actually do believe it was Imogene Thompson's blood on the armrest. The question is not whether or not it was her blood, it's how it got there. But while reviewing the serology report, I noticed that it states inadequate sample precludes confirmation of species origin. So looking at this official document, it's not even clear how the blood was confirmed to be human, much less Imogene Thompson's. But how the blood got onto Chapel's patrol car armrest, whether it was Imogene Thompson's or not, is not known for certain. When Danny Porter cross-examined Chapel at trial, he proposed his theory, the theory he stated as fact to the jury. So do you have any plausible, reasonable explanation to give this jury of why Emma Jean Thompson's blood was in your patrol car other than the fact that it transferred from the purse that you took out of her car after you shot her? A plausible one? A plausible. Seeing how it said unsecured for six days, anything could happen. But here's the thing. It wasn't rubbed off of the purse. We know for a fact it didn't come from the purse because the purse was actually found uh, shortly after the trial behind Imogene Thompson's house in an area that had been grid searched by GCPD after Mike's arrest. And it was tested and had no blood, zero blood traces. There's no way you could have gotten rid of all of the blood off of the purse. And so therefore, it was not the purse that placed that blood on Mike's armrest. So what did, or who did? Porter's theory is that after shooting Imogene Thompson, Chapel grabbed her purse and threw it into his car, transferring the blood to the armrest. Then, at some point within the next eight days before his arrest, he, or someone working with him, ditched the purse onto the wooded property behind Imogene Thompson's trailer. Chief Deputy John Laddie stated that extensive grid searches were performed on that property several times in 1994, before the trial, but found nothing. 
It wasn't until a 14-year-old named Dwayne Perkle, whose family lived next door to the Thompsons, found it under a piece of plywood in a junk pile in February of 1996. Chapel's defense was not notified until January of 1997, after learning of the find from outside sources. But as Henry mentioned, no blood was found on the purse, and no fingerprints were found on any of the items inside. Porter later explained this by saying the purse had been exposed to water from a small creek nearby, removing any traces of blood. But this is what he said when we spoke about it. So is that still how you believe the blood was transferred into the chapel's car? Yes. And I I base that based on not only the circumstances of it, but also the void, the spatter void that was in Emma Jean Thompson's lap and in her chest. So at the time, based on the blood spatter evidence, at the time she was shot, her purse was sitting in her lap. So the blood, instead of hitting her lap, was hitting the purse, you're saying? Right. That's what a void is. The, The purse was found by a teenager in her neighborhood and turned in. And of course, again, this was after the trial. It was in a creek under a board, as I remember. I did see documentation that there were no fingerprints on anything inside the purse that they could recover, uh, as well as no blood on the purse. Right. My point is, if this purse was bloody enough to transfer, granted, it had been some time that had passed, but, you know, what happened to the blood? I don't have an answer. I, I don't I don't know. One of the best... Uh illustrations I ever saw, I can't get any better than this, was uh, Mr. C, who bought the uh, Thompson trailer after all this went down. He heard on one of the TV programs way back in 07, 08, that uh, Porter's description of how it had been found and uh, the purse had been found in running water, and that was a reason it had no blood on it and all that nonsense there. And he went out and took a panoramic shot exactly where the purse was found because he was there. The photographs are amazing because you can plainly see there is no creek. It was just a shallow little border, not even a ditch, just a 10, 10 inch, 12 inch incline. They actually had large trees growing up out of the middle of it, so it never had water in it. But uh, that whole theory about running water, washing away blood evidence is complete and utter nonsense. On a phone call with Chapel, he explains why it's so unlikely the purse ever had blood on it to begin with. He tells me that it would have been nearly impossible to get all traces of blood out, least of all by the elements alone. They have told us that. It was just, this is utterly ridiculous, especially on a natural fiber uh, from what that purse was supposed to have been made out of, uh, like some kind of cotton type. And once the enzymes are there, you've got to really, really clean it to, to uh, I'm talking about with, uh, we were told some kind of exotic chemicals just to uh, completely rid it of the enzymes. So it's once there, it's always there. You know, let's put it this way, they're still finding pliable blood samples off of Egyptian mummies, you know, millennia old. So, yeah, that's always bothered me because, you know, got the, you got to look at the, uh, what Porter put out there to the jury and to the world that there was no other mechanism for transfer of so-called blood other than the, quote, bloody purse. Well, okay, uh, you know, that's reasonable. Well, what happens when uh, you find that mechanism months and months after trial? And it's, it's not as you said it is. But the real question here is this. If the purse wasn't there when the property was initially searched, how did it get there? And who placed it there? Chapel was already in jail, and it would have been impossible for him to do. But as for Chapel's claim of blood being planted in the first place, here's Danny Porter. The, the whole planting idea, I mean, that was argued out in the, in the trial. Even if you assume, let's, let's take the assumption that the car was left unlocked, okay? So that it was subject to be tampered with. Because he argued that we had this big conspiracy going and that I was just being led around by the nose by the, by the police. First of all, don't you think that if we were going to frame him with blood evidence, that we would have poured a bucket of blood in there? I mean, 
uh, not a sample that could be challenged and even its basic validity could be challenged. But more importantly than that is you have to have blood in its liquid form to smear it onto another surface. So, you know, when her clothes were taken off and sealed up and put in an evidence room, they were basically no longer a source for that evidence. Really, the only way that we could have obtained the blood was from autopsy. And all the vials where blood was drawn and urine was drawn and all that, they were all accounted for. So the only thing that's left is you have a mystery vial. You don't have to be a scientist to know that blood doesn't stay in its liquid state very long. It coagulates. So to prevent that back then, I don't know if they still do it, we got into the same argument they got into OJ, which is the anticoagulant. The blood that is used to test for DNA, or it was at that time, was put in tubes that were clearly marked that had an anticoagulant, and the anticoagulant was part of the test. Unknown samples don't have anticoagulant, whereas known samples do. And that sample that was tested from the armrest did not have any kind of anticoagulant. Correct. (laughs) Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app available 24-hour roadside assistance and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you can save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. All eyes in the state of Georgia watched closely as the end of the trial drew near. I wondered what could have been going through Mike Chappell's mind through Danny Porter's. Two years I'd sat in that cage and thought about this and waited for my chance. And here it was. It was my chance to do battle with my antagonist, Danny Porter. This conviction was as important to me as any other case I've ever tried. I worried about that every day of the trial. I I worried about it at night. And the day that I had to do it, I was probably up about 3 o'clock in the morning. I pretended a charcoal grill was Mike Chappell, and I cross-examined a charcoal grill until the sun came up. Mike was either going to save himself or he was going to break himself at that point. As Chapel tells me, he was confident he would prove his innocence going into the trial. So confident, it may have actually worked against him, as this juror shared in a 1997 interview with Dateline. I think he thought he was above the law. He was the law, but he was one step above that. Oh, absolutely. I, I absolutely. I, I was uh, confident to the point of... Uh, Arrogant, some said. But they, you know, like I told a, I told a reporter one time, she commented on that. She said, uh, you seemed uh, somewhat to the point of arrogance in your attitude. I asked her, I said, I had waited two and a half years for my shot to tell the truth in the courtroom. I said, let me ask you something. I said, I do the New York Times Sunday crossword puzzle in 10. You tell me, is that conceit or confidence? Who is it you want coming through your front door when the bad guy's got a knife at your throat, the baby's throat? Do you want some Mr. Golly G-O-Y or do you want somebody large and in charge and decisive? That's that's me. I knew this is the battle I've been waiting on. So, yes, I was anxious. Saunders took uh, confidence for arrogance. Okay, I'm sorry about that, but it is what it is. Well, I was really looking forward to doing battle. Even after all of the prosecution's evidence against him had been laid out, Chappell still felt confident as the jury prepared to deliberate. Even up to the uh, deliberations, we, 
But we thought the tide had turned towards us. Seeing, I was watching the faces of the jurors, and I was watching, uh, you know, and I was hearing the feedback from my family and, and friends and then, and lawyers and uh, whatnot, and then the infamous uh, declaration to uh, my team by the DA during lunch on the final day of testimony. When I well, when I was going before I was going to testify, when the when the juror came forward, and they had to have an ex parte to interview each and every juror because a female juror said that she heard uh, two male jurors at the first morning break. One said to the other, uh, "The state's railroad in chapel." It's obvious. You can imagine after five weeks of trial, what you, that's what you want to hear. It was high fives and everybody. And then my lawyers told me that uh, during lunch, the DA came to them and basically surrendered and said, you got it. Some of the jurors had serious questions about the evidence presented, about the raincoat, the DNA, and the initial investigation itself, which seemed to bolster Chapel's confidence even more. They left a doubt in our minds, even though they may have not been able to get any kind of decent testing from it, at least they would have tried. I had a lot of questions right from the start. And the first thing I thought was, why on earth is the Gwinnett County Police Department investigating itself? But not all jurors were as convinced of Chapel's innocence as he had hoped. Even though the DNA analysis was a very strong one, but it was everything else combined from the, the hundred dollar bills that were around from the the witness who said yes that's the man i saw to the other people that saw a police car there were so many nights i just lay awake thinking what if i make the wrong decision i was just scared to death after days of jury deliberation the decision still had not been made as two jurors continued to hold out now by the third day I thought, if we don't get a verdict today, we've made a mistake somewhere. We're in trouble. It would take five days, the longest in Gwinnett County's history, to finally reach a verdict. This is in the matter of the state of Georgia versus Michael Harold Chapel and Diamond. Your heart's pounding, and your mouth's dry, and you're just, you, you're just waiting there. And uh, then he starts to read the verdict. As to count one, murder, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty as charged. absolute dismay at the total collapse of our judicial system. I knew what I knew. I knew I had not killed Ms. Thompson. And I knew what the evidence was showing and what had not shown. It wasn't there. The conviction wasn't there. And the jury, the jury, they, they compromised. One of them said at the after conviction party, well, he can get out on parole or uh, appeal rather. I would like to ask that person all these years later, well, ask me how that went, ma'am. Yeah, I was just utter dismay at the collapse of the uh, of the system. When the conviction came down, the the whole integrity of the of the process was the end the end result of my whole job, my whole career there. But uh, to see it collapse like that was just it just broke me. Well, I mean, certainly I felt vindication because there were there were groups of law enforcement people who were supporting him. And, you know, with certain members, particularly in the sheriff's department, there was a lot of anger. And so I felt like we had been vindicated on that. And, um, you know, there's an overall sense of relief. And of course, you can't show any of that emotion in a courtroom. Michael Chappell was now a convicted murderer. The jury would again deliberate, this time to decide if Chapel would spend the rest of his life in prison or be executed in the electric chair. And jurors were once again divided. I think that someone that could commit a crime like that should not be on this earth because I believe in an eye for an eye. I don't think that 25 years in prison's enough. He'll be on the street one day. I firmly believe in an eye for an eye, but there's just something that would not let me vote for the death penalty. Nobody wants to die, but I can't even recall my feelings at the time because I was just numb. 
After just five hours, Chapel's sentence was read before the silent, anxious courtroom. The verdict as to penalty is as follows, that the defendant, Michael Hale Chapel, be sentenced to life imprisonment. Chapel received two life sentences. He was also given five years for the possession of a firearm during commission of a felony. Erin Chapel shares what it was like to hear that her husband might never again come home to her and her children. Well, I certainly didn't sign up for that. And I was unhappy and sad and hurt and mad. And it just affected us on so many levels. I was like, God, what are you doing to us? If I wasn't so strong and I didn't have God to comfort me and protect me and take care of me, I literally would have died. I didn't sign up for this. He's my best friend. He's my right arm. I mean, in in two seconds, you think back on, you know, did I screw this up? Did I, you know, have I have I persuaded them? Have I? And I knew they weren't going to give him the death penalty. I just knew it in my heart. The trial was now over, but for Chapel, the fight would continue. He tried to adjust to his new life in prison while he awaited his appeal. But it would be a long, lonely wait as his new reality slowly sunk in. He was in prison. For life. But shortly after the sentencing, a stranger offered Chapel a lifeline. This stranger made it clear that he was not going to let Chapel rot away in this concrete cell if it was the last thing he did. Back in 2008, when I started researching this case, you know, it had been years since I'd had any contact with anybody in the Chapel family. And, you know, at some point after the trial, I kind of accepted that Mike was guilty. But in 2008, I was, uh, I was in my home office and I heard Mike's name on the TV. It was a forensic file show. I was kind of struck by how weak the case seemed to be. You know, they presented the case kind of from the prosecution standpoint. And, uh, and I felt like it was really weak. And so I Googled Michael Chappell's name, and uh, one of the first things that came up was a, um, an analysis done of the case by a guy by the name of Philip Sullivan. After Chapel's conviction and sentence of life in prison, an alternate juror named Philip Sullivan immediately began working on a comprehensive analysis of everything he'd heard over the five-week trial. Sullivan is one of the main reasons Henry Ball took interest in Chapel's case. I didn't know who he was, never heard of him before, but his analysis was pretty eye-opening learned about Reddy and Rooster and, you know, they're lying on their log sheets and lying about, you know, the times and changing their testimony and all of that for the first time. Learned for the first time that Mike had witnesses that said he was at the firehouse. Learned about the purse and the purse having been found with no blood on it. And, uh, and all of this was laid out by Philip Sullivan. So I got to looking into who Philip Sullivan was, and it turns out that he was an alternate juror in the 1995 trial. So I was like, okay, wow, that's, that's kind of interesting. Because, you know, you think when there's a jury verdict and the jury votes guilty, you think all the jurors believe the guy is guilty. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Sullivan was adamant that Chapel was innocent and had been railroaded even stating that the guilty verdict was a gross miscarriage of justice. And Philip Sullivan was no easily duped conspiracy theorist either. And so what I come to find out about Philip Sullivan was that at the time of the trial, he was a retired former military intelligence officer. He had been a, uh, an executive in the technology industry, and he believed that Mike Chappell was absolutely railroaded. And he was very disappointed in Mike's defense. My name is Philip Sullivan. I was born on 
uh, December the, the 20th, 1932. That makes me 88 years old. The first memory I have, I believe, was in That's Philip Sullivan from a home video shared by his family. Born in Superior, Wisconsin, Sullivan, the fourth of eight children, joined the Minnesota National Guard at just 16 years old, beginning a lifelong love of the military. He would later serve in the Air Force and the U.S. Army, reaching the rank of captain. Unfortunately, Mr. Sullivan passed away in January of this year. In the nearly 400-page comprehensive report that Sullivan authored after Chapel's trial, he meticulously detailed his conversations with the other jurors, running his own investigation and interviewing witnesses. He was determined to help get Chapel exonerated. One of the areas Sullivan concentrated on most was what he considered ineffective counsel. He immediately reached out to Mike's defense, like within days of the trial, and essentially laid out for them the, the things that they did not do. They didn't attack this piece of evidence, that piece of evidence. They didn't develop Mike's alibi. They didn't develop the lost evidence, the dispatch tapes. He really put it to Johnny Moore and Elizabeth Rogan that they had done a poor job. Surprisingly, Elizabeth Rogan's response was, well, I've talked to Johnny about all this and you make some very excellent points and we're going to try to get Mike a retrial and try to utilize these points in his retrial. That was the defense's answer to not defending Mike, basically. We'll, we'll try to do it at retrial. So Philip Sullivan essentially became the first armchair investigator. He then got himself certified as a you know, full-blown private investigator. And he worked with Mike for years essentially trying to clear Mike's name. And he characterized this as the most uh, egregious miscarriage of justice that he had ever witnessed. And he did everything in his power to try to overturn it. And in fact, he spent the rest of his life and a considerable amount of his own retirement funds trying to overturn the conviction of Michael Chappell. Sullivan notes conversations that he had with several of the jurors after the trial and was dismayed at how they ultimately came to their decision. Immediately after the trial, the jury foreman said we, it was like we had blinders on. None of us, we were all confused. We didn't know what was going on. They, they were confused. They had blinders on. They didn't know what was going on, but they went ahead and sentenced a man to life in prison. You know, they thought he was gonna win an appeal. You know, heck, they don't know how the appeals process works. They didn't know that he wasn't going to win an appeal because Danny Porter was going to oppose every single, you know, every single thing that came down the pike. And he was never going to get a fair evidentiary hearing. And to this day, that trial is the only time that any of the evidence has been reviewed by a judge or jury. Sullivan passed out pamphlets around Gwinnett County outlining his findings and observations about the trial. He wrote to the courts, providing detailed analysis of things he found to be evidence not properly presented or contested by Chapel's defense. Things that may have changed the outcome. One of the big issues he had with the defense team was the fact that they really didn't attack a lot of the prosecution's case, nor did they develop Mike's alibi and and the description, you know, of the person seen at the at the muffler shop. I've read much of Sullivan's documentation, and it's extremely detailed, citing specific laws and codes, as well as various examples of what he felt to be Brady violations and also violations of other constitutional rights of chapels. He spoke with DNA experts, crime scene reconstruction experts, all paid for out of his own pocket, all because he was that adamant that Chapel was an innocent man. In a letter penned by Sullivan to the Chicago-based Center on Wrongful Convictions, he states, I have spent literally hundreds of hours, especially in the last three years since all others have given up, analyzing the trial transcripts, police reports, and the statements of witnesses trying to squeeze the truth out of this case. Now, seven years later, I have succeeded. The only problem I have is that no one will listen. 
One thing is for sure, Philip Sullivan, armchair detective, became a hero to those supporting Mike Chappell. I would say Philip Sullivan, you know, got to the truth. I mean, he uncovered the truth, but he wasn't the only one. You had Mike's father, who was a deputy sheriff, who spent years cataloging evidence, finding evidence. There were others through the years, too, just like Philip Sullivan. But there's one armchair investigator to pick up Chapel's story that may prove to have been the most important of them all. Pamela Holcomb was probably the most interesting of the armchair investigators. Pamela Holcomb and her husband owned a small business in Liberty, South Carolina. While watching TV one night, she came across a Dateline special profiling the Chapel case. As she watched the show, presented largely from the point of view of the prosecution, she immediately felt something wasn't right. Well, I think it was probably similar to my experience. It was told from the kind of the point of view of the prosecutor, if you will, but but the, the case was really weak, you know, being that they were they were really putting forward the you know proposition that that Mike was guilty, but the the evidence against him just didn't really support that in, in in a lot of people's opinion. So you could look at the facts of this case and realize that hey, something's wrong here, and and a, that happened with a lot of people. I mean, it happened with me. It happened. Philip watched it firsthand as a juror. You know, it happened with him, it happened with Pamela, it happened with Tom Conroy, it happened with Trafficant. Um, It happened with a lot of people. They said that the episode that they ran about Michael's case struck such a chord with their viewers that it was, at that point, the most highly rated episode in the the program's history. According to Aaron Chappell, who was told by Dateline's producers, that episode caused over 20,000 people to flood the studio with calls after its first airing, enough to temporarily shut down their switchboard. So Pamela Holcomb, just as several before her had done, began her own investigation. It's actually a pretty wild story. Porter was essentially, and this is 10 years maybe even 15 years after the conviction, frequenting a, an online chat room on the scanguinette.com chat room. And they, you know, they had a chat room that was dedicated to Michael Chappell. And most of the people in that chat room believed Michael Chappell was innocent. And a couple of his family members were regular participants. And Porter made it his habit to go in and argue with them over Mike's conviction. And he made the statement that if anybody didn't believe that Mike was guilty, they could, they were free to come and look at all the evidence in his office. And so Pamela Holcomb sent him an email and took him up on it. She wound up spending many days for the better part of 10 months going back and forth to his office and going through the files. And she took her little first generation smartphone and she recorded a lot of evidence that we did not previously know about. When I spoke to Danny Porter, he remembered Pamela Holcomb. I just pulled the file and sat her outside my office and let her look at it. So she would come down and and her husband would drive her down and put her up in a hotel and, and I think he would hang around. But anyway, she looked at it. She looked at everything. She looked at physical evidence. She looked at the police reports, everything. Holcomb spent months driving back and forth to Danny Porter's office in Gwinnett County from her home in South Carolina. She dug through box upon box of evidence, case notes, transcripts, and the like. She was the first person to really have unfettered access to all of the files associated with Chapel's case outside of law enforcement. And in those files, Pamela Holcomb found something. Several things, actually found in Imogene Thompson's car on the dashboard was a single long stem yellow rose in a cellophane wrapper. The yellow rose was not mentioned at trial and can be found on none of the evidence logs. Yet, we know it existed because it can clearly be seen in photographs of the crime scene. Holcomb also found previously unseen crime scene photos. 
The dispatch tape from Firehouse 14 traced the serial numbers on the four $100 bills found in Chapel's car back to their origin, and found blood index cards containing Emma Jean Thompson's blood used for testing, which had been apparently illegally removed from GBI custody. But the bombshells, according to Henry, is that in addition to Holcomb claiming to find and listen to the Firehouse 14 radio transmission tape, which could prove Chapel was at the firehouse at the time of Emma Jean Thompson's murder, Holcomb also rediscovered that a set of latent fingerprints and a partial palm print were found in the car, but were not provided for defense examination. Whether or not those fingerprints were on the cellophane wrapper of the rose or not, we don't know for sure, but they were found in the same area and discarded. And I don't know how they would have been discarded. Like if it, it had been a set of lifted prints, like on a evidence card or whatever, I, I don't, I mean, you know, I think protocol would have been that they sh wouldn't have been able to discard either. But whether they just discarded the rows with the fingerprints or the rows and the fingerprints separately, I don't know. We, we know from the record that the fingerprints existed. But we did not know from the record that the rows existed until Pamela Holcomb went on her little sojourn into Danny Porter's office. And she recognized a lot of crime scene photos that had not been turned over to the defense. So she broke out her little first generation smartphone and she documented them and she started taking pictures of them. And one of the things that she found was the yellow rose. Henry, just as Pamela Holcomb had done, searched for proof that the yellow rose was ever even entered into the property logs as evidence because Chapel's defense team never knew it existed until after the trial. We then went back and looked at the evidence logs and there was always a, one suspicious evidence log. If you look at all of the evidence logs, none of them had the chain of custody filled out, which is kind of a no-no, but all of them are blank. The chain of custodies are blank. I think there's a signature at the very bottom, but none of the you know, this officer had it on this date, turned it into evidence, then this one checked it out and so on and so forth. None of that was filled out, except for on one out of like eight logs. And on that one log, there was a one yellow paper. The pictures don't show a random yellow paper anywhere. And to my knowledge, there was no random yellow paper ever produced as evidence but it does appear on that log. Now what's interesting is that the chain of custody was filled out completely on that particular log sheet. And Jack Burnett's signature appears four times. And those four times overlap all of the other signatures, even though they're dated in some cases before the signatures that they're written over. So in other words, his signature overlapped this signature and overlapped that signature. This signature and that signature supposedly were written before Jack Burnett's, so they should have overlapped Jack Burnett's. And according to a handwriting expert, all four of those signatures were written on the same day with the same pen and the same ink pressure, even though the dates occur over two and a half year period. A handwriting expert said, whoever signed this signed it same day, same pen, same, same pen pressure. The handwriting expert was hired by Pamela Holcomb. And if these claims are true, this would mean that not only were the yellow rose and the latent fingerprints found at the crime scene discarded or destroyed, but the evidence logs were also manipulated. And all of it was concealed from Chapel's defense at trial. Now you have to ask why. What, what could have been on that yellow rose or that cellophane that would have caused them not to want the defense or the jury to be able to examine it? The fingerprints found were described in case notes as being too small to belong to an adult. So that clearly ruled out Mike Chapel. But whose fingerprints were they? And could this person be another viable suspect. So they have this 
set of fingerprints too small for an adult. Well, well, what does that mean? Does that mean it was a young adult, teenager maybe? Don't know for sure, but what we do know is there was a, a teenager associated with this case that was actually a suspect in the previous murder that we talked about, the Russian boxer. You know, if you, you look at that case, I mean, that guy was brutally murdered. And to have a 16-year-old associated with that, you know, is just really kind of eye-opening. A kid by the name of Dennis Shelton. In the Land of Lies is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was written and reported by me, Sean Kipe, and I wrote and performed the original music score. Story editor is Jason Hoke, and executive producers are Jason Hoke and Gino Falsetto. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. Sound engineering by Shane Freeman. Creative producer is Henry Ball, and you can find Henry's book, Michael Chapel, at storiedpress.store. For updates about this and all of my podcasts, follow me on social media at Sean Kipe. If you like the show, tell your friends and leave a review. And as always, thanks for listening. You're about to hear a preview of Blood Ties, Strange Days. While you're listening, follow Blood Ties on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. Driver, are we okay? Hell of a storm. Surprised you were even able to land. I'm sure what I'm doing right now looks absolutely beautiful from the outside. A lone car wending its way up a majestic snowy mountain. This is snow globe material, straight up. But the next time you let your kid shake the daylights out of a snow globe, say a little prayer for the people inside it. Oh. When we finally make it to Dr. Kosar's facility on the top of this mountain, I am hoping for the best, but I'm bracing for the worst. Jesus, I've never seen so much snow in my life. Oh, that's Marisol again, okay? I have to tell her. No, let it go to voicemail. I don't want anyone to know we're here, Santino. Not yet. Oh, fuck it. Santino, please. Hi, babe. I know, I know, I'm really sorry. Look, I got held up at the office. I think it's gonna be another all-nighter. I know, I miss you guys too. Kiss our baby girl for me. Yeah, I love you. Oh, there, you happy? I'm sorry, Santino, and thank you. Whoa, oh, oh my god, shit! Oh my god! You've just heard a preview of Blood Ties. Listen to Blood Ties on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts.